This is Chapter 5, Strategic Planning, Strategic Capacity Planning for Products and Services. So capacity planning. So capacity is the upper limit or ceiling on the load that an operating unit can handle. So capacity includes equipment, space, and employee skills. So the goal is to achieve a match between long-term supply capabilities of an organization and the predicted level of long-term demand. So if you have overcapacity, the operating costs are too high. If you have undercapacity, you have strained resources and possible loss of customers. So here's some questions. What kind of capacity is needed? How much is needed to match demand? And when is it needed? So here's some related questions. How much will it cost? What are the potential benefits and risks? Are there sustainability issues? And should capacity be changed all at once or through several smaller changes? And can the supply chain handle the necessary changes? So capacity, issue, uh, capacity decisions are strategic. So here's some capacity decisions. The impact of the ability to um, meet future demands. They affect operating cost. They are a major determinant of initial cost. They involve long-term commitment of resources. They can affect competitiveness. They affect the ease of management and they have an important and complex they are important and complex due to globalization and they need to be planned for in advance due to their consumption of financial and other resources so defining and measuring capacity um, capa measuring capacity in units that do not require updating um, so if you measure capacity in dollars as inflation happens, then you know you're you can't you're you're measuring two different things. So so there's two useful definitions of capacity. One is the design capacity, and this is the maximum out rate, output rate or service capacity an operation process or facility is designed for. And then there's the um, effective capacity. This is the design capacity minus allowances such as personal time and maintenance. So here's the um, so the actual output is the um, rate of output actually achieved and it cannot exceed the effective capacity. So the efficiency is the actual output divided by the effective capacity. And then the utilization is the actual output divided by design capacity. So these are measured as percentages. So here's an example. So um, you have a design capacity of 50 trucks per day, an effective capacity of 40 trucks per day, and your actual output is 30 trucks per day. So your efficiency is actual divided by effective or 36 divided by 40 is 90%. Your utilization is actual divided by design, which is 36 divided by 50, which is 72%. So here's some of the determinants for effective capacity facilities, product and service factors, process factors, human factors, policy factors, operational factors, supply chain factors, and external factors. Our strategy formulation. So strategies are based on the assumptions and predictions about long-term demand um, patterns, technological change, and competitor behavior. So here's some capacity strategies. So one strategy is leading. 
So this is where you build capacity in anticipation of future demand increases. The second is following. So you don't build the capacity, or you build the capacity when the demand exceeds current capacity. And then the second is, the third is tracking. It's similar to the following strategy, but it adds capacity in relatively small increments to keep pace with demand. So then there's something called the capacity cushion. This is extra cap capacity used to offset demand uncertainty. So um, capacity cushion is 100% minus utilization. Um, so, um, so, so here's some capacity cushion strategies. So organizations that have greater demand uncertainty typically have greater capacity cushions. And um, organizations that have standard products and services generally have smaller capacity cushions. So forecasting capacity um, requirements. So long-term considerations relative to the overall level of capacity requirements. So they require forecasting demand over a time horizon and converting those needs into capacity requirements. So this is where we go back to chapter three forecasting. Um, you know, you're gonna spend a lot of money on this capacity, so you want um, a good forecast. And then short-term considerations um, relate to probable variations in capacity requirements. So um, short-term, you're less concerned about cycles and trends um, than with seasonal variations or other variations from um, average. Service capacity um, planning. So um, there's several challenges related to service capacity planning. One is the need to be near customers, which is convenience. Um, the inability to store services, so you can't um, store services for consumption later. And then the high degree of demand volatility, so the timing and volume of the demand and the time required to service individual customers. So here's some demand um, management strategies. Um, so you can offset capacity limitations um, with supply and demand. So you can have pricing. So if you have a shortage, you could increase your prices. Um, promotions, um, you could, if you have excess supply, you could have a promotion or you could have a discount if you have excess supply. Um, and then there's other tactics to shift demand from peak periods into slow periods. So um, one of my other favorite restaurants is Red Robin. And um, so they give you a Red Robin royalty card. So um, to have a royalty card, you have to give them your email address. And they'll send me emails where they'll all of a sudden say, if you come tonight, um, you, you can get 10% off or if you come tonight or tomorrow night. And so what they're doing is they can, they can send that to any number of customers that they want um, by doing the email. They, um, you know, so I talked to one of the servers and she said that it, from her perspective, it was really random who got those emails. I'm sure from a corporate perspective, they're, they're like, well, we predict our demand is going to be short 10% this coming Tuesday. So how many emails do we need to send out to increase that demand? And they can, they can manage that um, through, through those emails. So that's, that's an example of a demand management strategy. In-house or outsource. So um, once you um, determine capacity requirements, you decide whether you're going to produce the good or service um, yourself or outsource it. So some factors to consider are available 
capacity, expertise, quality considerations, the nature of demand, the costs, and the risks. So a bottleneck. So we'll, we'll talk about this quite a bit, but a bottleneck is any sequence in the operation whose capacity is lower than the other operations. So um, here you have operation one, you get 10 per hour, operation two, 10 per hour, operation three, 10 per hour, operation four, 10 per hour, and suddenly you have to go through this bottleneck operation where you can only do 30 per an hour, but you see that you're putting in 40 per hour. So then what's the optimum operating level? So the optimum operating level, if you, if you look at your average cost per unit and the rate of output, when that, um, you know, if you're making one of them, it's really expensive per unit as it, it gets down to the certain point where you have this optimal output rate. And then if you try to do more, you may be paying overtime, you may, um, other things could cost so that the cost could actually go out up. Um, so you get to the certain point where the cost per unit actually starts going up the more you um, have. So there's economies of scale and diseconomies of scale. So you have economies of scale if the output rate is less than the optimal level. So increasing the output rate results in decreasing average unit cost. And then the diseconomies of scale, this is where the output rate is more than the optimal level. And this is where if you increase the rate, you have increased average unit cost. So economies of scale. Um, so the reasons for economies of scale is fixed costs are spread over larger number of units. Construction costs increase at de decreasing rate as facility size increases and processing costs decrease due to standardization. Then diseconomies of scale. So the reason for the diseconomies of scale is distribution costs increase due to traffic congestion or shipping from a centralized facility rather than multiple smaller facilities. Um, complexity can increase cost. Inflexibility can be an issue or additional levels of bureaucracy. All of those could cause diseconomies of scale. So facility size and optimal operating level. So you could have a small cost, small plant, and you see your average cost per unit is high. You have a medium plant where it's a little bit lower, and a large plant where it's even lower. But it really depends on your output rate. So um, you see if you, if um, there's a point where the cost over uh, um, small and medium overlap. Let's see if I can show it right in here, this overlap region, that, you know, so right here, it's cheaper to have, if your output is here, it's cheaper to have a small plant. Over here, it's cheaper to have a medium plant. And then you come over here, there's a medium plant versus a large plant. And so there's the crossover point. So um, constraint management. So a constraint is something that limits the performance or process of a system in achieving its goals. So um, there's different categories of constraints. There's market constraints, resource constraints, material constraints, financial constraints, knowledge or competency constraints, or policy constraints. So um, this is how you resolve constraint issues. You identify the most pressing constraint. You ch uh, change the operation to achieve maximum benefit given the constraint. Make sure other portions of the process are supportive of the constraint. Um, explore and evaluate ways to overcome the constraint. And you repeat the process until constraint levels are at acceptable levels.
evaluating alternatives. So there's some techniques for evaluating alternatives. There's a cost volume analysis, financial analysis, decision theory, waiting line analysis, and simulation. Cost volume analysis uh, focuses on the relationship between cost, revenue, and the volume of output. So you have fixed costs, which tend to remain constant regardless of volume, variable costs, which um, vary directly with volume. Um, so um, your variable cost is the quantity times the variable cost per unit. Um, and then total cost is total cost equals fixed cost plus variable cost. Total revenue is revenue per unit times the quantity. Break-even point. Break-even point is where the volume of output at which the total cost and the total revenue are equal. So um, the total revenue minus total cost equals the revenue times the quantity minus the fixed cost plus um, V plus Q times Q. So here's, here's the formula. So um, another way of looking at the break-even point from a, um, from a retail perspective is, is, is Black Friday, where um, you go through the first half of the year um, uh, with, with a loss, and then from Black Friday on, you're, you're making a profit. So um, that's, that's sort of in a time perspective. This is, this is you know, where you, you produce the, the 15th unit. If you can sell 16 units, you're making a profit. If you sell 14, you're at a loss. So the break-even point is 15. So here's some cost-volume relationships. So um, here on the left, um, this one, this top, top one right here, here you have fixed cost, variable cost, and total cost. So um, this is so here you have a volume of units, and then the second is here's your total revenue. So here's your line with with total revenue, and so now you you plot those two on top of each other, where you have the total revenue here, and um, your total cost here and right here where these two lines overlap is your break-even point in the number of units so if you sell less than this or you produce less than this you're you're at a loss if you do more than this you're at a profit so then here is profit versus loss so you you say um, well I can I can um, the amount of dollars you can have this um, break-even point you show the profit and loss and now you can compare two alternatives so here's the profit from alternative A and the profit from alternative B and you have the same break-even point but in this this um, point here um, you know if if, if um, you know there's upsides and downsides with this so um, here um, you have the same break-even point, but you don't, if you're lower than this, you have less loss, but less profit over here. So that, that's sort of a cost-volume relationship chart. So now you can, you can talk about the number of machines um, where you, um, you vary with, if you have one machine, two machines, three machines. Um, and the, the, the the costs are fixed, um, and then you can you can say, well, here's the quantity. So over here, um, here's the total cost. Here's the total revenue. So right here, if I, I say right here, I have a break-even point. If I have two machines, and this is the quantity, and here's the break-even point. If I have three machines, so this this would be um, good. Um, it's it's almost like well. You might as well start with two machines because um, uh, you know you're not even don't even have a break-even point with my, one machine, and then you know if you can get to this quantity, um, and then 
as you come up here, you could then add a third machine as soon as, as, as you've, you've hit the, the um, capacity. So, um, so, you know, there's an implication where you have multiple break-even points. So this is uh, chapter five, um, and uh, it's been about capacity analysis. So there's a couple of things I wanted to go over the homework now. So the first thing is hierarchical planning. We talked about this before, mission, goals, organizational strategies, functional strategies, and tactics. So the question is, how would you apply this process to your own life mission, goals, strategies, and tactics? So um, a lot of times we don't even think about having a personal miss mission statement. Uh, you are taking this class to get an MBA. There's a reason. This, this, for some reason, you have a goal and a strategy to have an MBA. Does that support your life mission? What is your life mission? Do you have it written down? So, um, so, uh, so as a as an exercise, I'd like you to write uh, your own mission statement. So, um, write a personal mission statement and post it on the discussion forum. So. Um, and it can be as short or as long as you want. So here is my uh, personal mission statement, and you, it's it's a really long one. I don't expect you to have um, uh, this long a mission statement unless you've gone through this exercise before. Um, it has um, my different roles in there. It's just there for your reference. Um, but you know, what is your mission statement? So that, that's the forum discussion. Um, these are tend to be um, very personal, so um, don't comment on others. Just you know, go ahead and take a look at them. Uh, share your own and, and go from there. And then our assignment. So assignment for next week. This is a written assignment you'll turn in. Um, so consider an assembly line such as a burrito assembly line at Chipotle Mexican Grill. During slow times of the day, one server can handle assembly, but during very busy um, times, having many servants would, uh, servers would be prudent. Explain why either approach wouldn't work all the time and the benefit of matching the number of servers to the pace of customer arrivals. And then the, the, the next two questions, who needs to be involved in process selection and who needs to be involved in layout design? So this is the end of session two lectures. And um, uh, now you, you have everything you need to, 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 to do your homework.